stoicism gives me the tools to be like, well, there's no use in thinking and obsessing about that because I can't control what's going to happen in the future. What's giving me more and more peace and, and more like authenticity when I do my work and when I write and when I do go to, to work on my, my craft is like that mental training. Hey everyone, my guest today needs almost no introduction. Camila Cabejo, multi-platinum musician, one of the biggest pop stars in the world, billions of streams across all the streaming platforms. You've heard her on the radio a million times. She's great, and you might not know that she is a fan of Stoic philosophy. I found this out when I got a message from someone on Instagram. They said, how dare you not acknowledge what Camila Cabejo said about you on Instagram? And I said, what are you talking about? And I looked, and uh, Camila had posted a page from the Daily Stoic, and we ended up connecting, which was so cool. And, and we've become, I, I would like to say, friends. We, we've shared some book recommendations uh, and gone back and forth. And uh, I said, hey, do you want to do the podcast? Uh, thinking that she probably has way, way better things to do, you know, um, and I'm sure uh, a million requests to be on a million platforms. But she said yes, which was awesome. And so we had a great conversation. I'm coming to you from Arizona uh, visiting some family. Unfortunately, couldn't be in person. We should thank uh, Sean Mendez, her boyfriend, for doing tech support. We had some tech issues, but uh, here's my interview, and I think you will enjoy these philosophical perspectives from someone who has seen the world, who is literally Cinderella. She's playing Cinderella in the new Sony Pictures movie. Someone who's experiencing adversity and difficulty just like the rest of us. What do you do when your your business is uh, performing in front of large groups of people uh, and, and traveling and suddenly you can't do that anymore and you might not be able to do that for six months to an, another year? What do you do when life forces you to reconsider what you want your lifestyle to look like, what you want your routines to look like, what you want your focus and priorities to look like? When Marx really says no role is so well suited to philosophy as the one we're in right now, he meant that about his life as an emperor, but it also applies to being a pop star, being an actress, being a girl in her 20s, being a, a guy in his 30s, being a father, being single, being an artist, being an entrepreneur, uh, being whatever you are. We, we can all apply philosophy. In fact, we should be applying this philosophy because it makes us better. As the Stoics say, nothing prevents us from, from operating always with courage, justice, moderation, and wisdom. And those are the themes of my interview with Camila Cabello. Enjoy it. I'm so I'm so excited. I got a. Uh, I had my wife give me a haircut just for this. Oh, you look great! <laughs> it's weird times. I wish we could do this in person, but uh, of course, here we are. But here we are. What what time is it where where you are? I, uh, it is nine o'clock where I am. Oh, nice. Do you get up at like three o'clock in the morning? We I got up at I think six a.m. this morning, but that's because nice. we, we have kids, and so we don't have any choice about when we wake up. Well, I I kind of know what you mean more now because we just got a puppy. Mm -hmm. And Sean, <laughs> I told him, I was like, we have, because he's like nine weeks old, he has to be taken out. Like we have an alarm on our phone for like 2 a.m. And then in four hours for 6 a.m. And Sean, I was like, can you just, he like did all the, the all the, the, the pee and poo shifts last night. But, uh, and, and then tonight I'm going to do all the pee and poo shifts. So. I, I'm one step closer to knowing what having kids are like. And let me tell you, can I swear on this? Yeah, of course. I respect the shit out of you parents because we have a, a puppy and shit's been it's hard. <laughs> Not hard, but like, you know, it's a lot of work. No, it is. It is. I think what what's good about dogs and then what's good about kids is that it's sort of forced it. You can get very used to sort of getting your way and doing things only when you want to do them. And then the okay. nice thing about these sort of responsibilities is that they really don't care at all what you want, what you prefer. It's just sort of inarguable reality. Totally. And you just like, I have to be present. It just like forces you to be present and also to like laugh and, and be patient at situation. Like instead of being like so many times, like in the past few days, we're like, no, because he'll like, you know, eat another dog's food or he'll chew something up. And it just like makes you really really patient plus he's cute as fuck i know of course of <laughs> course it's a it's a golden retriever what's the name uh his name's tarzan tarzan very nice 
it's funny because when we first got him, he was like, he was so like docile and calm. We we're like, oh, we're going to pick that one. And then five days later, he's just become like a Tasmanian devil. And Sean and I were like, this dog's a genius. Like he just like made us believe he was this calm, like docile dog. And now he's like, ah. Well, if you think about what dogs, are, like I, I, we don't really realize how manipulative dogs are because dogs were wild animals. And we, we I yeah. think for a long time, people thought that we, um, we domesticated dogs, but it's really more like dogs domesticated themselves uh, next to us. So like dogs totally. basically are just really good at tricking humans into taking care of them, which is a really incredible feat. Well, have you ever watched The Dog Whisperer and, and, and read Caesar Milan? I mean, C Caesar Milan is, I feel like he's a low key stoic. Like, you know, even if, I don't know if he, like if he if he says that, but the way that he teaches, like we've been reading uh, his book, uh, How to Raise the Perfect Dog. <laughs> That's like what Sean and I's uh, our, our, re our reading list. But a lot of what he, like the way that he uh, teaches, like uh, educating a dog, like he calls it like being a pack leader mm -hmm. and, you know, always kind of like he, his thing is like, your dog is always going to take on your energy. So if you have like frantic, anxious energy, like the dog will pick up on that and like always being like kind of calm and assertive. So the dog like trusts you. And it's like, it's really, really interesting because it makes you realize how much we are really like how much we truly are all animals. Like he, you know, he talks about, only rewarding your dog with affection when he does something that you do like and when he when he doesn't like when they're overexcited just like don't acknowledge them as opposed to like just treating them like they're like human children and constantly being like hey I don't know it's just like really interesting like the dog psychology part of it is really interesting I, I did a show in New York one time like a, an interview and he was the guest before me and I, I got to meet him for like five minutes and you can really, there are these people that have like a kind of energy that totally. you just, it's like magical. Like it, it sounds so made true. up. Like how could energy like be this thing that is like projected or felt? And then you watch it on TV and you're like, how could you just be like sort of magically calming these dogs? And then you experience it and you're like, oh, this is a real thing. And, and it's, it's 100%. a, yeah, it's nuts. Well, I do think like, I mean, I think the more I get older, the more I'm realizing how much, I mean, we are all energy and so much of, he talks about how, you know, with dogs, it's like, no matter how much you say, no, stop, it's not your words. They don't communicate in that human language part. Sure. It's like your body language and your energy. And it's like, so much of that is true with humans too. Like no matter what someone says, it's like, you can really feel like we are energy like even if you're not consciously picking up on that it's like that's always what's underneath everything it's well yeah, what it's, i like about caesar milan is this idea that you could really be a master of anything so like he's totally. like the you know like, let's say the best person in the world at that weird dog energy thing yeah. and i was thinking i thought about him a couple uh, a couple years ago when we first started sending my kid uh, my son doesn't do it anymore because of the pandemic, but we started sending them to daycare. And like, when you have a kid, it's like, it's difficult to put them down for a nap, right? They don't want a nap. They run around yeah. like crazy. And then it was thinking that like these two women who were running the, the daycare, uh, one was from Cuba and, and the other was from oh, cool. like, Guatemala or something. And you're like, these two women put down 15 toddlers at the same time every day. And like, I can't even do one. And it, it's totally an, like, because I've watched him do it's it like one time. It's, it's totally an energy thing. Yeah. hundred percent. Totally. And then it makes you, like, when Caesar talks about that, like, keeping a calm, assertive energy for your dogs all the time, or, or especially when you want to discipline them, it makes you practice that muscle more. Sure. And it's, like, actually, the more that I, this is what I've been, like, really focusing on, like, especially in the past year, is how to, like, how much who we are is just like trained behaviors. And like, you can, you know, you can train an undisciplined dog. He could literally be a different dog just from how you train them and how you respond to their behaviors. And it's like the same with human beings. It's the same with your own brain. Like your own, I feel like my own brain is a crazy puppy dog that I have to it be is. like, no, no, you know? 
Uh, but it's like really empowering. I feel like that whole psychology of like how you respond to things changes the things themselves. Like I, I've become really like obsessed with uh, just like that, that mastery of like yourself and that mastery of your mind and, and your emotions. And it just like, I feel like is more emphasized by, by things that I like, like by the Caesar thing. I'm like, Oh, it's there too. Like how everything is, what happens and then your response to it. Well, have you noticed the last seven, eight months from the pandemic? Have you noticed, like, I, what I've noticed is that like, as you turn down the outside world, so you're not doing as much stuff, you're not as busy, um, you, you don't have as much going on. It sort of reveals to you, like, like my anxiety became more apparent to me. It became much more obvious that I have anxiety because yeah. it wasn't drowned out in other things. Do you know what I mean? And so I'm uh, just curious, yeah. like, have you, have you, started to get in touch with energy in your own life? I mean, I was I was kind of fucked before the the pandemic started. Like I, I feel like my anxiety was like at an all time high before um before COVID happened. I was like and I was kind of working through it. Like I was like filming a movie. My album had just come out. I was doing promo, but I was like at the same time it was just like I think that's why I, I really took in the last year like my own healing and and meditation and like all of these and exercise and nutrition all these things super seriously because i was like i was i was doing these things i was like doing promo and filming but i was just suffering so much because of my my state of mind and i think i had i had suffered from anxiety like from years before like i think like it but it really um, hit its climax because I don't think I paid enough attention to it and I was just working through it, working through it, working through it. And I think when it, when, when over the last seven months that I was able to stop in the beginning, it was my anxiety specifically because I had time to be aware of my thoughts and what I was thinking and my thought processes as opposed to I got to go perform fuck everything I'm feeling because I got to do a good job, which is sure. kind of what I did before. I was just kind of like override all, <laughs> sure. all of my, uh, you know, just just my, my internal struggles because I was like, I got to go on stage in 10 minutes. I can't be thinking sure. about this, you know? And it just really gave me time to be able to be in that, uh, in the, in the, in the self-awareness and the, be in the awareness of what thoughts were causing me suffering and anxiety and and feel it and and go through it because honestly because I had the time and I hadn't really had the time to really look at what was going on inside myself for like 7 years you know I I was just constantly it felt like my life was revolving around how to do a good job in my next performance how to do a good job in my next uh writing session, whatever. And it's like, it feels like that's like the short term solution, but it's not the long term solution because you're actually sacrificing your authenticity and like your truth to just like do a good job as opposed to like be who you are, how, how you are. Hey everyone, I've, I've talked about this before, but I don't drink coffee, I don't drink soda. So when I need like a jolt of energy, I've not always had the best options. But actually, right before I recorded this and right before I'm about to do the virtual talk I've got to do after this, I popped in a Neuro Mint, which are these great mints that give you energy and focus. You know, I think concentration and energy are hard at any point, but even harder during months and months of lockdowns from a pandemic. Neuro Mint makes these awesome functional gums and mints that help you better your mind, find the focus that's been eluding you, and do more with your day. It's got a blend of natural caffeine balanced with L-theanine infused with B vitamins and uh, frankly just tastes like a delicious peppermint. Each piece has got a half cup of coffee worth of caffeine in there so it's just enough to give you a boost but not enough that you feel jittery or weird after. So I pop one of these things in before I do a phone call, before I, I jump on a talk, before I've got to do something important and it just gives me a nice little boost. The L-theanine is found in green tea, so it kind of balances out the caffeine so you don't get jittery. Helps uh, reduce stress, energy focus without jitters, and the gums and mints help your brain function. 
Just go to getneuro.com to order your energy and focus mints and gum and better your state of mind. Just go to getneuro.com slash stoic or use promo code stoic to get 15% off all the products in their web store. That's G-E-T-N-E-U-R-O dot com slash stoic or promo code stoic to get 15% off your order. Well, what I found too is that because you're good at what you do, so in your case, it's singing for me, it's writing, is that the writing or the work is always as difficult as it, as it is and unpredictable as it is, you have way more control over that than other things. So you can mm-hmm. kind of channel all those energy, all that yeah. energy towards whatever you're supposed to be doing, like putting on a show. Or for me, it's like, I know I can go sit at my computer and, and stuff that's valuable will come out of it. But like dealing with my feelings or dealing with, you know, the more complicated stuff is much less predictable. And so you kind of end up sort of focusing on work at the expense of everything else. Totally. And it's, it's scary. It can feel scary to be with, with, with your thoughts and feelings because it is like, that's also why, I mean, I, I feel like honestly, stoicism and meditation have helped me the most in in the past year. Like both of those things like the kind of I feel like stoicism is kind of like the cognitive reframing of stuff which is so important because when I the tools that I get from meditation not even meditation really mindfulness is the awareness of what my thought processes are and I'm like no wonder I have fucking anxiety because look how I'm thinking about this situation and then stoicism gives me the tools to be like well there's no use in thinking and obsessing about that because I can't control what's going to happen in the future. I can't control, you know, when I, the performance is tomorrow. There's no amount of thinking today that's going to, if anything, it's just not, it's not useful, you know, but like I found that the most important thing and the thing that really has given me more peace, most importantly, because I'm, I think as I'm getting older, I'm like, I feel like peace is even better than like moments of joy sometimes. Sure. Like, it's just like so much better. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that like what's giving me more and more peace and, and more like authenticity when I do my work and when I, when I, and when I write and when I do go to, to work on my, my craft is like that mental training. I think it's so huge. And I'm like, honestly pissed that I didn't get taught those tools in school because I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I feel like I, I had to, <laughs> search and search and search and and go through so much suffering like i don't know what's been your like experience with with anxiety but like i it was fucked like it's it's it sucks like feeling anxious like it it sucks and i feel like i was like feeling anxious more than not like eight eight months ago you know and it's like it's so invaluable to have tools like you know you're you're not your thoughts. You're the observer of your thoughts. Or oh, how can I reframe this situation so it doesn't, you know, so I I don't, you know, so I don't stress about it or whatever. Or breathing, like all of these things, like I feel like have are changing my experience of life. And it's like that's your mind is your life. Do you feel like you can sort of gut gut it out? Like you can perform well, uh, anxious. You know, you can Definitely. write anxious, but then. It's, it's sort of realizing like, oh, actually when you're doing it from a place of stillness or peace or, you know, when you're, when you're not being driven by your thoughts, it's just at like a whole other level. Definitely. I mean, I think like there's been so many times where I remember like specifically a couple times, which is, it was last year really, there was, it, it was really a span of like seven months where I feel like I was really struggling with anxiety and like, um, I've talked about this openly before, like... I don't even, I don't want to, I don't want to say OCD because I don't know how much of it is, I don't know. I don't know how much of it, I don't know personally if it helps me to just put a label on something or, Mm -hmm. but anxiety and like obsessive thoughts for like six months, it was just like at a peak. And I had two performances that I specifically remember, AMAs and SNL. And like, I finished SNL and my team was like, my manager was like, that's the best performance you've ever, you've ever done. Cause it does feel like in performance, I can channel, we were talking about energy. It's like anxious energy or suffering or pain is a lot of energy. And so it felt like I could really channel it and and almost like 
put all of that energy into every word or every movement. And it almost like, it's like when Beyonce has said before, nerves are actually a good thing because it's energy. And it, it suddenly, if you were hitting a move like this, that energy makes you hit it like this because there's so much kind of sure. coming out. But I do think that it's not a good trade-off because especially for example, in something like writing, when it is coming from a place of stillness and peace, like I've seen in the past few months, even like writing for my next project now, it's like, it's so much more authentic. It's so much more truthful. And I'm so much more proud of it because it's not coming from a place of that day trying to get a certain outcome or uh, trying to impress the other person that's in the room or really thinking about anything in the future. Like what's come from me kind of training myself to be present and just be, be truthful um, and it coming from a place of stillness, I think is so much better, so much more rewarding. And honestly, fuck the result of the performance. It's like you actually end up your, your, your life changes. Like you're like, you're able to make connections with people because your mind isn't, you're not being like, your life isn't being drowned out by the noise of your mind. Like there's just, it's, it's, it's so worth it to, I feel like invest in that mental training. Cause I think a lot of times people are like, I don't know. They they look at it as almost like I don't have time to do that because I have to go do my work and I and I have to do all of these things. But it's like investing in yourself and in kind of like training your mind to work for you as opposed to be this thing that actually stops you from from being your best self and like blocking you. It's like it's so so worth it and it makes everything else better. You know. I I know exactly what you mean. Uh, it's weird to me talking to you because. Like I think you're the the first guest that I've had that I'm older than, because uh, oh, I'm yeah. so I'm so used to being the 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 young person because that's sort of uh, like you. My right. career started very early, so yeah. every all, all the authors that I've known or you know managers and agents, everyone's older. But mm. I remember when I was I I had this sort of epiphany when I was about your age. It was realizing like okay, so it's working for me. Like the anxiety, the intensity, the energy. I'm getting good results out of it, but it's not sustainable. Like, I don't want to do, I don't want to be yeah. in that sort of adrenalized state for the next like 30 years. Like uh, you're yeah. not going to survive that way. And so it's sort of realizing like, you're not having any fun doing it. And if it's not coming from a place of stillness and contentment, like you're going to burn out or die if you keep going this way. 100%. Well, I think what happened to me right before the pandemic was I did burn out. Like that's what it felt like for me. Like I felt burnt out. I felt honestly like I was like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore, but it it wasn't doing this. It was the way that I was doing it. Right. You know, it was like, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. It's so much anxiety, so much stress. I feel unhappy. I feel like my, my mental health, therefore my physical health is suffering. Like I wasn't sleeping well, like all of these you know, I, I wasn't sleeping well. I felt like my nervous system was out of whack because I I feel like it was just a habit for me to be in this kind of fight or flight state. Yeah, I, I forgot where I was going with that. Um, what, what were you just saying before that? Well, just like how how you can sustain this. Because I think what's oh, yeah. interesting is yeah, like yeah, yeah. M most most singers in your position, it seems like they they have a meltdown in their mid 30s, right? Like you it doesn't yeah, seem to last. Me. A hundred percent. Well, I think that I would have, I would have at some point, it would have been unsustainable. And I would have been like, I actually have to stop. I don't know when I'm going to come back and do this. But at this point, my health is suffering and I, and I have to stop. And I was kind of forced to stop by, right. uh, we all were. by everything, by everything that happened. And I, it was like, it was really necessary time. Like it was necessary for me to kind of go go through really just like I wrote this article about uh, like for mental health awareness month about OCD and about anxiety. And it's like with anything, it's like it, with your physical health, if you break a leg, like you got to heal the leg and, and nobody's like judging you for it. You just like take some time and you, you know, you get a cast and you can't walk for five days because it's, you got to 
recover. And I think like with mental health, it's like, it's different. It's, you know, nothing's going to happen if, if you just do nothing, but it is worth taking time to be, to treat it, you know, even if it's like 10 minutes a day of like doing exercise or doing something that you know, that is good for your mental health or, you know, like really there's, there's so many different things. But, um, I, in the past eight months, I feel like I've like literally my life has changed. Like, I'm like so thankful for it because I, I think that I would have spent a lot of years being unhappy. And at the same time, this weird thing of just like, not like just keeping going because you think that's what you're supposed to do. And yeah, I'm just like, I'm so thankful for this time because I, I feel like I'm like more and more just the, the boss of my own mind and, and the boss of my own life, as opposed to feeling kind of like victimized by anxiety and, 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 and mental health struggles. Like, I feel like that was like constantly something that I had to overcome to do things. And now I kind of like did it the other way where I'm like, I'm going to get to the root of this fucker so that I can, you know, so I can just like be, be free of it. And, uh, it's totally possible. No, I, I, that's something the Stokes talk about, which is like, what good is success if the result is that you don't feel like you're in charge of your own mind or your own life? Like, how, how is that success? Exactly. And that's like not what this society, we as a society are taught. And actually so much of I feel like healing is being like, what of this is like what I actually want and what of this is just like what everybody else is doing and I'm doing it because everybody else is doing it like that, you know, and stillness is the key like that really resonated with me. Like what's your definite and ego is enemy too. When it's like all of these questions about like, what is success to you? Like is success being famous and having these awards? And I, I, I've, I feel like it's especially a necessary teaching nowadays. Cause I have like, you know, my little cousin who's like eight years old and I'm like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she's like, I want to be TikTok famous. Right. And I'm like, it's like these values of like, no, what's important is, you know, how content you are with your life. Like the level of, of gratitude that you experience. The most, most importantly for me right now, like the connections that you have with your, your family and your friendships and your community and the, your purpose, like your, I, I genuinely do feel like my purpose is in, in art, you know, I don't think I actually, even though I, it's always been my passion, my favorite thing to do, like, I feel like in the past eight months, I, I really was like, oh no, this is like what I, what, what I want to do, you know, like, this sure. is like what I feel like my, my purpose is. And it's like not doing it for any out, any outcome of like being famous or success or what people think of you, which it can subconsciously, like, I know, I mean, I can, I can only speak for myself, but like, even when you don't say that to yourself, like, I've never been like, I want to be the most famous. I want to be number one. I've never said that, but I remember like reading ego is the enemy and being like, but then at the same time I go to do a writing session and I care so much about what these people in the room think of, think of me. Like, I'm like, so insecure and, and afraid. And like, that's, ego too, because I'm still not doing it for the right reasons. Like the, the, the right reason is to tell my truth. That's it. Period. There's a great Marcus Realist quote. He says, um, we care about other, we care about ourselves more than other people. He says, but we care about other people's opinion more than our own. Right. And I love that quote. It's, it's so true. Like you, 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 pour yourself into this thing, doing it the way that only you want to do it, you know, and then, and then all of a sudden it comes out. And then what you're thinking is like, did other people say it's good or not? And sometimes you need a project. I, I did a book a few years ago, this book called Conspiracy, which I think is my best book, but it sold the, the least well out of right. all of them. It didn't like right. fail. It just, it just didn't do maybe what it could have done. And what was really freeing about that experience was it totally decoupled, like, critical success and sales for me from like what I know is good. And that's like, it was such a huge breakthrough. It was such a huge breakthrough for me when I saw like a couple months ago, I was, I was like, you know, I read ego. I read obstacles the way, like, I think like two years ago. And I, that was actually my, the, my, for my second album, I read 
um, a friend wow. of mine gave me uh, that book. And so I read it and it told, I remember like reading it and then for the next like two months while I was reading it, like my writing sessions were like amazing because everything, even, even my own insecurity and my own like fear, I was kind of using it to fuel, you know, I was doing that that uh, stoic teaching that I love so much, the Amor Fati, the taking mm -hmm. everything and and even the bad stuff and loving that it happened, not just accepting it, but being like, oh, I'm gonna use this now. Um, and that's the first time I read that book. Then like three, two, two years later, um, I read Stillness is the Key. And that was actually when I was, when I was, that was like a year ago, actually. Um, that's when I was going through the height of my, uh, my, my mental health crisis. And um, that really impacted me. And then during quarantine, I read Ego is the Enemy. And I started really getting into stoicism. And I got like the Daily Stoic Journal. And I was reading the Daily Stoic videos. And one video that really resonated with me was the one where you're talking about how Stoics define success and and the internal scoreboard yeah. and how it's like there's success that's like, okay, how many views did this get? How many likes did this get? Uh, how successful is this, is this song or this album going to be? And that's all the things that you can't control. So if you measure success like that or how other, what other people in the room think of me, then you're going to be unhappy your whole life. But if you change your definition of success, which I really practice, I've really been practicing when I've been writing for this album. If I change my definition of success to how honest was I today? How vulnerable was I today? How, you know, did I, did I show up completely as myself? Was I kind to, to people? You know, was, did I see people? Did I make this a fun experience for everybody in the room? Like if I just keep it in, in terms of, if I just focus on what I can control in this moment, then at the end of every day, I was like, it was, a, it was a su successful day. Even if I did feel anxious or nervous, I was like, my metric, my metric of success was, Hey guys, I, I, I feel a little nervous, you know, and I was truthful. And therefore I met with my like standard of success. And it's like, that's so much more important. Like it's so much more important to be the, the person that you want to be and, and lead with, with that than like how other people perceive you or what people perceive you. Like that's like what I, what I love about stoicism and like what I feel like is going to be my philosophy of life forever is like, which it wasn't before. Like I feel like I was leading with what I was doing instead of who I was being, you know, it's like, you know, I was, I just like now I'm, I'm so conscious of like <clears throat> me being, you know, brave and and courageous and kind and you know and and truthful and you know me me my character comes before any of the things that i do you know it, it one of the reasons i think it's it's important too it, it's not just like decoupling success from results because like you could fail or 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 whatever but i remember i was watching the the taylor swift documentary the, the netflix one yeah. a few months yeah. ago and she's talking about this moment where she wins like album of the year. She has the number mm -hmm. one album of the year, all, all these things. And she's just sort of like, now what? Like she's unhappy yeah. because she got everything she wanted. And that's a yeah. real thing too. You, you can, you can, if, if you have told yourself this lie that like, I will be happy when I accomplish X, then you get X and it's really disappointing. And, and that's when you also kind of realize like, oh, you can't be doing it for these external things. You have to be doing it because you love music and the byproduct is these extra things. Totally, totally. And that's like where I feel like the the meditation stuff has been really useful is that it's constantly like your brain is always telling you, is always like is stuck in, in the past or in the future where in the future things will be better or in the past things were better or in the past things were bad and now they're still going to be bad or in the future this might happen so this that's going to be scary and now this moment is bad it's like but none of that is true and it's like you you also another stoic teaching that i love is like you you could fucking die at any moment sure. so it's like why would you put it off it's like also it's like the stuff that you're 
practicing in your mind and who you're practicing being as a person in this moment is who you're going to be in, in, you know, six months from now, if you keep doing it the same way, like, you know, if you are always like looking at what you don't have and, and what you need to be happy, then it, that habit in your brain, it's like a pattern, like that's not going to stop, you know? And I feel like I've like, I feel like I also discovered about myself, like in the past year, like I don't really see myself as like, I don't think I've ever been a, like a negative person or a pessimistic person. Like I think I'm pretty optimistic. I'm like pretty like bubbly and like, and, and hopeful, but I have, I have recognized like within my own mind how much like, which is what anxiety is. It's like anticipating the future or not being present enough to see like what's going on around you. And yeah, just like I've been practicing that lately a lot. It's just like looking around and being like, oh, I'm like so grateful to like have water and like be, be talking to one of my favorite authors and, you know, have a puppy. Like I'm so grateful for puppies that puppies exist. Like just like the practice of always looking around and and, and tr like training that muscle of like wonder and and gratitude. It's like that I'm like just like excited for 10 years from now when hopefully that's just like a a personality trait and not something that I have to practice, you know, but like it does things do become like actual personality traits when you practice them, just like anxiety. Then I was like, oh, fuck, I'm an anxious person, but I'm not. It's just that's what I've been practicing. Yeah. Yeah. A friend of mine was saying something they, they were talking about. They were like, uh, they were like, I don't like they'd always felt that they were like scared of driving at night. They didn't like driving at night. Yeah. And then they realized they're like, oh, no, no, my mom is scared of driving at night. And I just right. like picked that up. They're like, that's yeah. not actually who I am. And that they were like, I can discard that and just practice a new skill where yeah. I am not scared of driving at night. Totally. I actually have that. My grandma has a fear of birds. And sometimes like birds will be flapping. And I'll be like, <gasps> and I'll be like, wait, why am I? Oh, it's my, my grandma's fear. It's, it's, it's weird. It's there just is made also, up. It's, it's made up. And there is also, I don't know how much of this is, is theory and how much of it is science. And I, this might be, I, I actually want to be careful with that because I, I don't, I'm not sure. But it is like some stuff is passed down like through your, through your genes and stuff. I don't know if a fear of, of birds is, but you can, but what is you also- You can reinforce like, think, it over yes, and over again. You, yes. you can almost like turn on or turn off the gene based on like what you, what you do. Um, you know, this is my second ever podcast. Really? What was the first one? Uh, my vocal, my vocal teacher is starting a podcast. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. And so we did like a, we did a podcast about, about singing. Sean did it too, but this is my second ever one. Am I doing a good job? You're, you're doing great. You're doing great. Um, <laughs> I, Ego but, is the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> no, to, to go back to what you were saying about, you know, being happy for water and a dog. I, I think the Stoics talk about like how little is actually needed to have a happy yes. or a good life. So I true. think one of the things COVID has done is sort of shrink our expectations for what we need. And yes. it, it's been nice for me. I'd be curious about this for you. Like I, I found that once I, I sort of started looking much more inward, started looking much more around my immediate surroundings, and I have a lot less interest in what other people are doing. And that's mm -hmm. contributed to my happiness in a huge way. You, it, It's hard for people to realize like, I remember I had dinner with this billionaire a few years ago and he was like talking to me about the Forbes list. Like he was talking about like the other people on the Forbes list. And it's like, you're a billionaire and you're, th you're even still, you're like 100%. comparing yourself to other people. But that idea that comparison is the thief of joy because it makes it, instead of being able to appreciate that you have a puppy, you're like, oh, but somebody has, you know, a mansion and a puppy and therefore right. I'm deficient for not having both. Totally. I mean, that's so true. And like, what's sad is that's probably like that, that trait is probably a big part of why he's a billionaire because he sure. was constantly like, oh, you know, this person has more than me. I got to work harder. This way. And like, uh, that's something that I feel like is always, is kind of subconsciously taught to us too, is that competitive thing. Like I know, uh, I feel like even probably more, I, I've seen it so much in, in my industry of like, you know, 
I, I felt it within myself, like just being like, oh my God, like I have so much to be grateful for. Like I look at where I, I, I started. I never thought I would be here. The fact that I even get to do this is fucking insane. And then you go to, I experienced this so much, like when I would go to award shows where it's like, they call, they do this thing at, at award shows. It's great for, for your ego in, in the good and bad way. It's totally sarcastic. Um, but they call out everybody's names and then like everybody, you know, the people around sure. will clap. And it's like, I just like, I remember going to award shows and, you know, they'd be like, Ariana Grande, wah! And they'd be like, Camila Cabello. And like, they would, in in my mind, they would be clapping a lot less for me. And I'd be like, Oh my God. And it would just like affect you so much to the point where like you would go up to get an award and you'd, you'd be like, Oh my God, I, I don't, I don't deserve this. Like I heard it in the room, not as many people clapped for me. And then it makes you, then there's the thing that happens in your brain where you're like, I got to work harder. I got to, I got, I got to work hard. And it's like, it's, I hate that, that version of myself. Like, I don't hate, I don't hate that, but you know, I, I don't, that's not a, a pleasant version of myself because then once I'm out of that space, especially now that I have been for like a year, it's like, you want to be like, who cares? Like, I'm just happy to be here. Like I, whatever, you know, and you want to be happy for the the people that got, you know, the, the loudest cheers and the most awards. Like, it's like, it's like really enforced, uh, probably in all industries, but I, I, I can speak about like the music industry. Like there is this sense of, of competition and constantly like, you know, trying to be the number one. And I, I actually, I have to say, like, I do feel that when I'm at award shows and if I'm on social media, you know, and I'm looking at what every other artist is doing, like there is that part of, of you that'll be like, I got to work harder. I got to do more. But I have always felt like, this is actually my favorite chapter in probably any of the books, but in stillness is the key. When you talk about this metaphor for it's like, if everybody on this planet plus the planet is one human body, it's like, there's the person that, you know, symbolizes the eye and the eye's got to be the best eye, not the best hand, just got to be the best eye. And that kind of metaphor for all of our roles really, I feel like, stuck with me because I've always felt like maybe it's like, it's not everybody's job to be number one. It's just your job to be you. Like the world needs you to be you. And it's like, even that book conspiracy, it's like, even if it's sold less than all the other books, there's a group of people that fucking loved it. And it really affected them deeply. And nobody could have done that except for you. And it's like, I feel like that about some people that are like, you know, some, uh, you know, meditation teachers or, you know, people, you know, if people that maybe not a lot of people know or, 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 uh, singers or artists that not a lot of people know, but for me, they've affected me so deeply. Sure. And it's like, I, I, I feel like I've really carried that and I'm going to try to always carry that next time I go to one of those award shows and, and just be like, I can only just like be the best me. And if, if five people like really resonated with what I said, like, that's great. And maybe that person is, is meant to, you know, it's like, they're the eye and, and I'm the hand. I just got to be the best hand. But that really takes the pressure off when I go into the studio. Like, I'm not like trying to get a number one song. I'm just trying to be as true to myself as possible because that's what is going to deeply, not superficially, but I think deeply affect people. Well, look, and you could—that's not true. I don't know. No, no, you—you you, gotta—you're doing the song, and you could die before the song comes out. So, so you true. have to think about whether it was just as whether it was its own reward. I think that's where I—I I try to think about that. It's like, look, think about all the authors whose books came out after they died and then were a success. So, like, they didn't get to enjoy any of that. So, if they it's didn't so enjoy making it, that's really, really sad. If they weren't it's proud fun. of it when they finished, that's like the saddest thing in the world. And I've actually had experiences where I didn't have a great time that day in the studio and that song became successful and I ended up really dis disliking the, the song. Like I never liked it, even if yeah. it was successful. I didn't really? even want to perform it. 
and like my 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 team would would be mad at me and be like but uh, this has this many streams and i'd be like i don't like that i don't like it i'm not gonna perform it and i didn't <laughs> wow <laughs> but but i've actually like you know i've I've kind of, I got to say, I got to pat myself on, on, on the back because I have always been really like ruthless about, I don't, not really like giving a fuck about the, the commercial success part. Like I, I do have like sub, I think subconscious fears about like, if I'm writing, like what people in the room think of me and if I'm writing with Pharrell, I'm like, I really want him to think that I'm good. Sure. You know, I have, <laughs> I have that thing, but I I definitely like the whole billboard, the charts and like writing stuff for it to, you know, be a number one and sound like everything else on, on the radio. Like I've, I've always like really not been into that. And when I don't like something, like I just like, I won't, I won't do it because I'm just like, I can't. I, can't I wrote this, it. I wrote this email for Daily Stoic, which I'll forward to you. It was a couple of years ago, but it, it struck me once I was listening to I don't know, it's like hits of the 90s on Spotify or something. And I'd heard of like most of the songs because that, that's sort of when I was a teenager. And then, then it was like, then I was listening to like uh, 80s and I, I knew a lot of the songs because uh, I, I like sort of heavy metal and stuff. And then, then I went seven, I was going backwards in time. And it, it was interesting to me how quickly, these were the biggest songs of that right. period. How quickly, not only like I wasn't like super familiar with them, but some of them, like, I'd not only never heard the song before, I hadn't even heard the name of the person who'd done it, right? right? And that's something the Stoics talk about, which is just kind of how ephemeral it all is. And so totally. if you're not enjoying it, and if you're doing it because you've deluded yourself into thinking that you're going to be, like, famous for all time, this will be this legacy that lasts forever, you're really depriving yourself of the present moment, which is all that you have. It's so true. It's so true. I had a, a friend um, who once told me like, you know, we were speaking about like legacy and he was just like, legacy is like for everybody else. Yeah. Like it's like, no, it's, you're not dead. Something that, it's not something that you get to enjoy. And it's also like who, I always remind myself this, like, is everybody, is anybody really going to care like in a million years? Like who no. even knows? if we're going to be here, like, who right. knows? you know, who knows, like, who was the most, you know, the, 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 you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and we were just like in, in tribes, and there was like a, a famous, famous singer woman around the campfire, like, she was the best, she was the best one, but I don't know her name, right? you know, like, it's, uh, it is like, that's such a refreshing concept, it really is. And that's like something that Ego's the Enemy taught me too. I was just like, when I get so riled up about a writing session or an interview or a performance, I'm truly thinking too much of myself. Like nobody cares that much. And like the people that I, that do, like I, I actually, I just finished filming a uh, Cinderella, uh, which is like my first film that I ever did. And I was Cinderella, which is crazy, Incredible. but talk about that. I mean, it was, it was, it was amazing, but it's like, it, that was it's a, it felt like a pretty high pressure thing to do is I, I'd never been in a film before and I was you know the lead role for my first film and that took a lot of like really I had a lot of like mental uh, like tools for me to show up every, every day and be able to have fun and, and not think and not really make that pressure the focus like I remember I actually do, do you know Michael Gervais yeah I do uh-huh Okay, so I, I work with him. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Is that I, how you I found out with... about my books? No. Oh, okay. No, no Michael's amazing. About... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He told me that he told me that um, you guys are friends, and there's been many times where we talk on the phone, and I'm like, I was reading Ryan Holiday's book, and he's like, Ryan, he's a good friend of mine. Um, <laughs> and um, anyway, so I was uh, I, I I've, I've talked to Michael Gervais a lot, and um, while I was doing the the filming. Um, I would talk to him about just like the stuff that I was experiencing. I'd be like, Hey, tomorrow is a big scene. Um, you know, I'm feeling nervous, whatever. And, um, he was just like, he's, he's, he's given me a lot of wisdom about when I do get nervous before things like writing sessions or where, wherever that I'm going to be like in a, in a vulnerable place. Cause doing that film was like really, it's really vulnerable. Acting is, is really vulnerable because it's like, 
you have to be so present. There's no outsmarting it. There's no like practicing the line before. And then you like, it's like all of it is really reacting to what's going on in front of you and, and being present. And, um, I had to kind of like make peace with the fact that this is for, I remember I was like, when I first came back from the pandemic, cause we shot it over two different, uh, periods of time. Um, I came back and I was like, I was feeling nervous when, 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 when I saw the camera and when the camera was in front of me and he was like, you're equating the, the camera with, with who, with what? And I was like, people, like people that are, that are judging my performance and people. And he's like, okay, how do we like turn that around? Um, who would you want the camera to, to, to symbolize or represent? And I was like, just like, you know, like, a uh, a young girl that's like a fan of mine and she's just like wide eyed and she's excited and she had a bad day and she just like wants some joy. She's looking for some joy when she watches this movie. And we actually like named, um, I, I named the camera after like one of my, one of my like closest fans, her, her name's Julia. And I just would picture her there. And it's like, anytime I'm nervous, I just picture who is this really for? Like, it's really for my fans. Like it's for, sure. it's for, um, Julia, it's for Aurora, it's for Steph. I'm naming, actually, I'm, I'm naming some fans for Dom shout out. Uh, <laughs> but it's like these people that you are like, it's just as simple as that. It's not about your legacy or being the greatest of all time or anything like that. Like if that happens, like cool, but it's, it's just to make people happy. It's like not really, doesn't have to be more complex than that. And that's like the most rewarding, I feel like way of thinking about it for me. It's like, that's, that was my, my purpose in that movie. It wasn't even to prove that I'm like a, a great actress or whatever. Like I, I just, I, if I just made them smile and, and made them happy, like that's who it's for. It's not for any kind of outcome or, or reputation or, or praise. Yeah. There's a Bertrand Russell quote where he's saying like the first sign of a, a an impending nervous collapse is the belief that your work is terribly, terribly important. So true. And- and you I've can, experienced be, it firsthand. Yeah, it's be, because it is important to you and because it is important to your livelihood and because there is pressure, you sort of internalize it all and it becomes this like massive thing. And it's like, it's, it's really, it's like you're, in my case, it's like you're writing words on the computer. Like this is not, this is not totally. that important. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And like the, I feel like the, idea of I, which I feel like extends beyond like what you do. It's like, I have found like, especially in the last eight months, like how important it is to have, to fa- feel a sense of purpose, no matter what you do. Like, it doesn't matter if you're in the arts or if you're a doctor or if you're a teacher or if you are, you know, it, it does it doesn't matter if you're an Uber driver, it doesn't matter. Like, I think like having a sense of purpose makes life so much better because if you're like, you know, my purpose is just to make people smile today. My purpose is to, you know, make people, uh, believe in the goodness of other people. Like, I think like when you like wake up every day thinking that it just like, you don't want to waste a day because you know, you have a job to do. I actually read over the past eight months. I don't know if you've I think you have read it because you quoted a lot the the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. Of course, I love I loved it. It really aff- impacted me. I loved like the the way that they describe when they said you have the right to work, you don't have the right to the fruits of your work. Yeah, have you read Stephen Pressfield at all? No. So you would love Stephen Pressfield. He wrote a book called The War of Art, which I think is like the best book about the sort of creative process ever ever written. Cool. But he also he. He, he made a, a novel about it called the, the Legend of Bagger Vance, which is also a movie with Will Smith and Matt Damon. But that wow. is like sort of a modern, it's, it's the Bhagavad Gita, but applied to a professional golfer. But his, wow. his stuff is amazing. And I think That's it's cool. like you, you have to have this sense of purpose and this sense of sort of it fitting in a large tradition. Like, like so it's weird. I think on the one hand, you're like, I'm just scribbling words down on the computer. Like this isn't that important. Yeah. But then also what you were saying where you were like, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, there was some woman who was like singing as part of a tribe. That's the other thing though, where I think you get purpose is you go, oh, but I'm also part of this 
really long tradition that it's not about me, but this thing is, goes back eons and eons. And, and that, that you take your identity and your purpose from being sort of like one speck on a really long line. Totally. And I find that to be like so much more comforting than just like being on your own and then everybody else. Like it's so much more comforting to know. And I really do believe that that's the truth that we are all one. We are all a, like little cells in this big body, this big system that we can't even understand. But it's like all of our actions and our energy and like, and really and and our and our energy and how we are like it it really has a ripple effect like a huge ripple effect um and yeah that's like a really comforting thing to 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 think in my opinion that we are like we're not alone we're all like deeply deeply interconnected with each other and with with nature and it's like we're not ever alone because we're we're part of this huge like higher intelligence, like we were, that's where we, we came from. There's a joke that every writer uh, wishes they were a musician. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it's because like you get to experience that when you perform, right? Like you yeah. get to watch 20,000 people come together as one entity that you're in charge of, but you're also a part of yourself. That must be very overwhelming emotionally to experience. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's really, it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful to see people like tapped into this, uh, to, to this thing. I mean, uh, music is so incredible for, that's like my favorite part of like being a human and, and not any other animal is like, is, is music. Um, and, and, and delicious food. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I'm just like remembering. Cause I, I don't, I don't remember the last time I played a show. Like, I think it must've been like a year and a half ago or, or something like that. But, uh, it's really beautiful. And like, when you see people like sing stuff and they're like crying and they're, you really see like them, kind of uh, experiencing like a catharsis of their own life and their own emotions. And like, you're doing that too, but you're all kind of doing it there together. Like, it's a really beautiful sense of, of community. And like where you see like how, how your, your story makes, it makes a difference, you know, like sharing your, your story exactly as you would share it makes a really big difference. And that, that's what I like, I, another thing that I feel like has been a common theme for me, like it went, especially when I was doing the, the movie, like I was like, I'm not trying to be like, I'm not trying to be a good actress. I'm not trying to do a good job. I just have to be me. And like, and with all of my shit, like all of my anxieties and this and that and my struggles and this, like the, the world needs everybody to be exactly who they are and share their story exactly as they are because the more like specific you get i feel like the less people feel alone because everybody is like there's nothing new that you and i have felt that somebody else hasn't and that's like what makes you feel less alone is when people are like open to to sharing that and i yeah i, I you definitely feel that in in a show. Do you know Casey Neistat? Oh my God, this is so funny. Cause Sh Sean asked me that same question two months ago because he and Sean are friends. Cause Sean is obsessed with like uh, taking videos now. And yeah. Casey, got, Casey gave him a, a camera. Yeah, so Casey's amazing. And I remember he did this video a couple years ago where he was showing like the different, he was like different levels of art. So there's like, or, or inventions. Like you make something and it's great. You make something and it's popular, that's great. You make something that's really popular, it's great or whatever. But he was talking about how like the ultimate form of art is to make art that helps people make more art. Love. And, and so he's like, the iPhone may be the greatest invention of all time because mm. like think of all the mm. things that people have done mm. with their phones. But what I think is so powerful about music is that it, it, it's great itself. Like when you listen to a great song and it, you know, it has some amazing guitar solo in it or it's like emotionally vulnerable and it, it's beautiful or just 
the singer is doing something incredible with her voice. Um, but what I think is like, do you ever think about like, so you have songs that have done like a billion plays. Do you ever think about like what people have done with that? Like, do you know what I mean? Like think about the yeah, art yeah. that your art has helped people make because they were painting while one of your songs was on in the studio or you know what I mean? Totally. Totally. I mean, that's such a cool thing to think about like that ripple effect. And like, I've seen like with my own fans, like, you know, them sending me videos of them doing covers or like them learning how to play guitar to this one song of mine, a couple, a couple of like my, like a few, a few of my fans have written poetry books because they've like gotten into, into poetry. Like, yeah, it is like that, that conversation that just like inspires people because art is like, it's just so cool. Like, it's just like, we get to make things like it's, it's so cool. Sorry, that was this. That was a not a not a very uh, eloquent sentence. No, no. There's sort of an ineffableness <laughs> to it, right? It's like you just you just well. There's a, a Longfellow poem where he talks about like sort of footprints in the sands of time. That that's what art is. Yeah. It, there's a there's a Latin saying. I forget what it is, but the but the, basically the saying is like life is short, but art is long, and that like you yeah. have the it has. You can capture something in a moment when you, you know, like I, I wrote my first book when I was 25 and that book is cool. still relevant. And it's like, I've moved on, but that book is still there and people are still interacting with it. And yeah, you see what it helps people do. It's just, it, to me, that's the ultimate reward of doing this stuff um, much more so than, than any like sort of sales or charts. It's like, if your thing totally. impacts one person, you're like, wow. Yeah. And it's also like, I feel like when you're, really old, like when you're like 90 or something, you can look back on it and be like, this is who I was at this point in time. I can't do that now because it's too cringy. But yeah. <laughs> but when you're old, you'd be like, oh my God, or you could show your, your kids, like your kids are gonna read your books. Like that's so, your grandkids are gonna read your books. Like that is so cool. That's really cool. There's this phrase that I really love um, about music. Um, actually it's about art in general, but my, I have this acting coach who is this like incredible person. He's a, he's also an author. Um, you should read read his his book. He he has a few, but he has one called At Left Brain, At Right Brain, Turn Left, or At Left Brain, Turn Right, or something. Okay. But, but anyway, he has there was this phrase that he he actually just uh, directed a film too, and there's this line in it that's like, these aren't just phrases; they're human outcries. Oh sure. And, and I just like love that about, that really makes me think of music because so much of the time it's like the chord progression or what you're saying. Like, I feel like that, especially when I'm like, just kind of listening to to chords and just making melodies or doing ad libs. It's like, it's coming from this place of no thought. It's just coming from a place of a feeling or just like full, just like feeling like it's just like because I find when I'm like really in my head I can't even ad lib like I I can't because it's just is all feeling and I think for my personality type because sometimes I've I'm like I say sometimes now probably a couple years ago would have been most of the times so I'm like so in my head that it's a really nice like medicine for that and it's uh yeah it's like so like it's almost like what's the word so like primal you know what i mean Something no so that's why that's why writers it. are jealous of musicians because like <laughs> what you're able to do instantaneously it requires like hundreds of pages for a book to do you know but like it does it, but it, it's different because sometimes musicians wish they could be writers because you can very like you can leave people with in, in instructional wisdom like sure. just like it is like it's it's just like this is you know you can you can touch people in a in a really really direct way like super like like life-changing way um I, I feel like they're they're different and then some some songs can do that but in music it's like you have to dilute it so much that it is actually more of a feeling than like than than words of wisdom it's just like a uh, almost like you captured a feeling in a jar and it's mm -hmm. like 
that you open the jar and it's like, and that's like the feeling, whether it's like, you know, being in love or, or sadness or empowerment. It's almost like this jar of like emotion that's like exploding. And then writing is like, it's just so like, it's exactly what you, what you want to say, you know? So musicians want to be writers too. Sean and I have, we've been like, I'm going to write a book now. Well, that, <laughs> but, I would, but, your expression that a, a song is like an emotion in a jar is very beautiful. Cause I, I was going to ask you, I have this super weird habit when I write, I, when I listen to music, it's almost always like, like I might hear a song of yours and be like, I like that song. And then I will listen to that song on repeat for like 200 times. That's and so then funny. I'll, I'll probably not listen to it again. But so when I write, it's, I'm, I, it's almost like I have these disposable songs. So like I'll, I'll pick something and then that I'm just trying like, and you play it on repeat to a, a way where it all kind of blurs together. And then you almost like kind of disassociate a little bit. And then that's where my writing comes from. And so for me, it's like, like, um, it's always about finding that like hit, like that sense of that some magical song that captures what I need. And then I want to so like, then, wait, so you ahead. listen to a song over and over. Yeah. And then you you kind of repeat it over and over until like and that's the emotion that you want and then that'll inspire you to write no it's like i'll hear a song and be like i like that song and then that goes and then it's like i'm i'm like like a vampire just like sucking all of right. that out so so while i'm writing this is why i can't ever share an office i'll have to like listen to that song on full volume you know like in every room of the space just playing over and over and over and over and over again i'm almost like a vampire i just suck it all right. the life out of it until until I it doesn't mean anything else to me and then I move on to the next song. Is that weird? You think you think that it doesn't mean anything else to you, but then when you listen to that song one year from now or two years from now, it's going to take you back to That's when true. you were listening to it all the time cuz there are songs that like I mean, there's songs that Sean and I would play basically the same eight songs, like the first couple months that we were dating. And I put those songs on now and I literally feel like I'm going to have some kind of stroke because it, it just takes me back to like my heart like starts racing. It's crazy. It, it just really takes you back to 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 that time. But it's because we obsessively we obsess. It's working now. Um, it's because we like obsessively played them. I actually feel like I have a different relationship with music now since oh, so. the since the pandemic well i feel like i used to like my sister's 13 and she listens to music all the time but like she listens to really intense songs all the time just in the background like you know we were talking and she's like has yellow by cold play on like over and over and over that's that's a, that's a good example of a song that yeah i might play like 200 times over and over right and right but but yeah as your point i, I do remember hearing that song when i was in 10th grade and yeah. it like now represents that to me. Totally. And if you played it, you'd probably have this whole like flashback reel. But I think nowadays I can't, I, I, it like, I have realized how much music, like really certain songs with words really are such a like mood dictator for me. Like they really trigger an emotional response. So I don't just have them like, I, I'm not really like, I don't really passively listen to to music. Like if I just I have music on in the background, it's just like instrumental stuff or more like ambiance, like you know Spanish guitar or something just in the background. But I can't really like listen to song songs passively anymore. Like the other day, I went to the dentist and I had to go to the dentist, and it was like they had like a TV playing, like HGTV and songs from like the early 2000s playing. And the dentist was talking to me and I was like, this is so much stimulation. Like I, it's insane. I couldn't focus on what she was saying. Cause when a song is playing, like my, I'll just gravitate towards the song, but it just made me think like, it's just so, I don't know. Like I, I can't, I, I have to listen to songs when I'm like, I'm going to really like, like watching a movie, you know? Do you listen to when you read? Um, I actually don't. Maybe I, I, I think I would if it was, I mean, I could not do music songs with words while reading because that would be insane. Mm -hmm. But I could probably do some like instrumental. But it just like, I feel like it still dictates the mood so much. Like it like, it, it taints what you're reading. Like if you were, if I start to hear like some piano music and it's sad, immediately... 
I'll be, I'll have like nostalgic thoughts or like a nostalgic feeling if I, you know, it like really colors the mood. So I'm like, I'm more intentional about, about it now. But to bring this full circle in the way that like Caesar Milan is like somehow on the wavelength with a dog because he spent so many countless hours doing it. I got to imagine given your relationship with music and what it's meant in your life, you probably feel it at a level that like an, a normal person can listen to music in the background, but you are operating, right. you know what I mean? You, that's like your superpower is your yeah, yeah, yeah. ability to connect with words and, and with sound. That's actually true. I hadn't thought about it like that, but that, that might be true. Cause the other day we were like, I, I hadn't listened to songs with words in a while and and Sean put on like John Mayer's like continuum and I was like <laughs> he put on like dreaming with the broken heart and I was like this is crazy it's just like so I don't yeah I, I think you're right especially when I've kind of like just been listening to instrumental chill stuff like when I put on like a song like that it's like it's like such a stark difference between like passive instrumental music and like a breakup song you know it's like no. I think really I could. I think there's a John Mayer song in each one of my books that was like a repeat song that I probably listened really. To a That's times. so yeah. cool. Are yeah. you a John Mayer fan? I am, but it, it's it more like in the sense that like there's a handful of songs that I really like. But yeah. um, and what's and your favorite? What's, well, so he has a cover of "Free Fallen" by Tom Petty that I think is almost as good as the original. Come on, I think it's better than the. It's so good. It's a that, that, that <laughs> like that's that a I, that I may have listened to that one during stillness. It may have been it may have been ego. I don't remember, but I probably listened to that song like three hundred times, four hundred times. So, so me you too. Know, in me a row. too. Yeah. Actually, that was my number one most listened to song when I was like fourteen. It was yeah. my number one song. So I listened to it three hundred times too. Like now. I, I feel like I know every part of that song. Like if my voice could do eight instruments, I could, that's how many times I've listened to that song. It's so good. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's incredible. And, but even like we were talking about like what a, mu- what a musician can do in just so, such a short amount of time. Like even the opening chords in that song, like in the, the Tom Petty version, you're just like, that, that w- that's just, I think there's a handful of songs that'll hit me and you're just like, this is what mastery feels and yes. looks like like this is the, yes. the culmination of a lifetime created these three right. seconds of music right well i i have a question I'm, I'm i'm curious about because you we've been we've been talking and you're like you write every single day mm-hmm. pretty no much matter what, so, so but like let's say new book came out yesterday are yeah. you writing this morning so the day the day that sto- of my most recent book came out, which is Lives of the Stoics, the Stoics, I was finishing the draft of my next book. Wow, that's cool. So w- this is actually something I'm jealous of with with musicians, where like you can put out an album like right away. L- Lives was finished in January of 2020, and it just came out. Okay. So it it, wow. it just takes so much longer most of the time I mean they can rush books out they just don't but I'm I'm usually one book ahead so I've already finished my next book it's going into editing now but like I'm I'm in a I'm in editing of of the next book so how many hours a day how much time a day do you spend writing and is it every day including weekends it's, it's almost every day it's I'll do, I'll definitely write on the weekend, but it's a different routine because like weekends are more for family. So I might yeah. like do a, like, usually what will happen is like, I'll, I'll be working out and I'll have some idea and that'll be like a daily stoic email or something like that. But right, not, not right. usually not working on a book on the weekends. Um, but like, I, I try to like sit down at my desk to write usually like 830 or nine. And I'll, I'll be done by like 11 at the latest. So it's usually That's like cool. two, two and a half hours. And then right. just that right. cumulatively over a long period of time adds up to books. That's cool. I feel like I need to integrate that. I feel like I need to like have a, a routine with, with writing music as opposed to like when I, when I feel inspired. Yeah, I, I think so. So read this book, The War of Art. His, his It's okay. like, I think it's the, the best, the best book about the creative process ever written, but his his point is like, you, you have to put, he's like, you have to put your ass where you want your heart to be, um, yes. which is an expression I love. And it's like, love. Um, 
if you, he, he has this idea of the resistance. Basically, it's like we all want to make great art all the time, um, but then the resistance gets in the way. And so if you only write when you're inspired, I think you're in a, you're in a tricky spot because like your mind can always come up with reasons why you're not inspired. Totally. A hundred percent. No, I, I know. I know. So yeah. I, I love the routine, but then, and then it's also, I think writing books is like, you have to get, you probably like this where like when you're writing, you're in a different headspace. It's like training for a fight or something, right. you know, or like right. training to go into space. I remember I had this dream once when I was, this is, I forget which book it was, but I had, I had some, I, like, I remember I had this dream and it was like, I was getting in a rocket ship and it was blasting off. And when I woke up from the dream, it was like, oh, it's time to start the book that I'd been researching. Like, it was like, it's time to go. And so I've, I've more gotten to a place where instead of having this like start and stop where it's like, I'm training and then, you know, then I'm taking a break. I'd rather just be in, in fighting at my fighting weight all the time. So just never stop. Yeah. That's so smart. I love that. I'm definitely integrating that. That's cool. Well, well, uh, I'll let you go because this has probably been way too much of your time, but we should, we, we should talk routine. To me, I think if you don't have a routine yes. or a practice, you're just getting by on like your sheer talent and, uh, and, and like your youthful energy. But when you really look, it's like, how is LeBron James still performing at the level he's performing at? It's because it's a machine and he's just riding it, you know? Yeah. Wait, what's that quote? That's like consistency over excitement or something like that. Consistency over, but that yeah, right. no, that's it's, it's yeah, totally. I totally agree. I totally agree. Well, this was so fun. This was amazing. I appreciate it so much. I'm so glad we got connected and, Me too. uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll have to stay in touch. Me too. Let's be friends. Let's be friends. Let's do it. <laughs> Ryan, you're amazing. And you seriously, I mean, I, I told you the other day, my mom, Sean, me, we're your biggest fans and you've changed our lives. Stoics forever, baby. I love I get it. The, I get the email. I get the journal. I get the daily stoic, the, the daily. That's part of my morning routine is reading one page a day. Oh, man. The leather, the black leather one. So thank you for everything. Seriously. You're the best. That's, a, that's amazing to hear. And uh, it's it. I think what's what's interesting for me is, yeah, like I've listened to your songs a bunch of times and you're it's it's just weird to to put a face to the work. Well, likewise, because like Sean told you the other day, we've we've heard your voice on, on the audio book so much. And now your, your face is moving. I love it's it. Exciting. All right. Talk soon. <laughs> OK, talk soon, Ryan. Bye.